Hi, and uh, welcome once again to the uh, Dean's Lounge, an initiative of Porto Business School. As you know, the Dean's Lounge is a manager of Forum for Reflection, where the Dean and the Associate Dean of the Porto Business School invite distinguished scholars, experts, deans, and other colleagues from business schools around the world to uh, discuss issues that are relevant for the future of business, government, the economy, and society. Today, we will reflect on the role of IT in business and society. As you know, all our operations have been affected by COVID and no matter what business you are in. It's true, even in our own industry, education. We will all remember March 2020 as the month where almost all schools in the world shut down their doors. Governments actually instituted worldwide uh, closures and that affected about, you know, the majority of students worldwide, 90% according to UNESCO. But the speed of these closures and, and the rapid move to distance learning allowed little time for planning or reflection on the potential challenges and the potential opportunities. But can you imagine how a much greater ch challenge this would have been if this pandemic had struck just 15 years ago, before we had access to broadband, to smart, smart devices, smartphones, and a bunch of other online services that help us now navigate our life through our living rooms. Imagine then that for half of the global population who still have no internet access, they don't have critical health advice at their fingertips. They can't check in with friends and family by video calls. Online working and learning from home is not an option for them. Most of those offline live in low and middle income countries. Women, the elderly, and people in rural areas too are disproportionately without internet access. And compounding the connectivity gap, people in poorer countries are also less likely to have access to resources needed to protect themselves, like a safe place to isolate, a strong healthcare system, and the financial safety net to be able to forego work if necessary. The pandemic has made it painfully clear the consequences of this digital divide, and it has access, exacerbated the social and economic gaps. In fact, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals included a target for universal and affordable access to the internet in the least developed countries by 2020. With only 54% of the world online today, we have actually failed to meet that uh, sustainable development goal of universal access uh, to the internet. And the UN Broadband Commission has set a series of targets for connecting the other half, the one being to, to reach internet access user penetration of 75% worldwide and 35 in the least developed countries by 2025. All right, before COVID, we already were experiencing and talking a lot about the disruptive power and the transformational power of IT. Digital transformation, digital by default, industry 4.0, artificial intelligence, robots, 5G networks, you name it. But now that COVID-19 has forced us to telework, we have been made even more aware of the importance of IT. I guess our, the conclusion is that IT matters, and it matters more than ever before. And this is precisely the topic we will be discussing tonight, the strategic impact of IT on business and society. Our guest tonight is Rob Galliers. He's one of the pioneers on strategic IT, and he has been researching, teaching, and discussing on this topic for four decades. Bob is University Distinguished Professor Emeritus and former Provost of Bentley University in the United States and Professor Emeritus and the former Dean of Warwick Business School in the UK. He's currently an, a, senior a Senior Advisor at EFMD, the European Foundation for Management Development in the Quality Services area. And he was previously the Research Director at the London School of Economics and also the head of the School of Information Systems at Curtin University in Perth, Australia. He has been the founding editor-in-chief 
of the Journal of Strategic Information Systems until December 2018. He has more than 100 journal articles and 14 books to his name. His most recent books published in 2020, in fact, are Managing Digital Innovation, A Knowledge Perspective, and Strategic Information Management, Theory and Practice, which is running in his fifth edition, in its fifth edition. Bob, welcome to the PBS Porto Business School Dean's Lounge. Thank you very much, Ramon, and thanks very much for the invitation. Sure. Um, let me start with the, with the first question. I mean, you've been researching on this topic of IS strategy and open strategy for a long time. In fact, I had the opportunity to work with you in the past also in, you know, as, as, as one of the uh, associate editors in, in that journal that, that I referred to earlier. Um, and when I look back, I remember one particular uh, article which was published in the Harvard Business Review now a few years back um, with the title of IT Does Not Matter by Nicholas Carr. I refer to it as an infamous article because it had many consequences. It had a sequel, it was also published in the Law and Management Review, and it seemed to you know, imply that, look, look guys, this is a commodity. He said something like, this is like the supply of electricity, and such technologies now have become ubiquitous, the cost decreases, just commodities, you know. There's no strategy uh, involved in this. There's no strategic standpoint. They become invisible. They no longer matter. As a result of that, many business schools stop dropping uh, IT management courses. And, 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 you know, there's a whole story behind it, which you can maybe elaborate on. But the point is that you wrote, I remember you wrote a rebuttal article in the Financial Times saying, ignore technology at your peril. In it, you pointed out that while IT may per se no longer matter, the management of IT and information systems and the associated services has never been more strategic than ever before. You said, literally, what Mr. Carr and others who share his view do not understand is that competitive advantage never arises from technology per se. The advantage comes from the astute and forward thinking harnessing of that technology. What is needed is for considerations about information systems to be integrated into business and knowledge strategy. You need executives who understand what technology can and cannot do. Our management practices have to move forward away from the old style thinking that focus entirely on exploiting IT to exploring new possibilities. Rob, these are very powerful statements. Can you elaborate on all these concepts and it's been a while since you wrote that, but you know these statements sound very, uh, you know, true today. If you look back, we're going into ancient history when you mentioned that art, that article, um, but they do strike a chord, don't they? Um, I, I still believe that despite all the changes that have taken place in technology. And if we think that we've come to the end of the road, as far as those changes are concerned, then think again, please, because we'll be looking back in five years' time and thinking, how old-fashioned were we back in 2020 in relation to the technology? And we hear these days, don't we, things like, you know, data analytics, big data, all these things, as if these were the new... Um, uh, I don't know how to how to describe it, but the, 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 almost the answer. We in, in information technology, we are we're always talking about IT solutions. Um, I would rather talk about the questions rather than the solutions, frankly, because most of those solutions tend to have uh, side effects that we uh, aren't expecting, and some of those are, are positive as well as negative. Um, I'd, I'd like to move on, move us on a little bit, though, in, in relation to, yes, IT matters in the sense that it gives us opportunities. It matters in the sense that, as you mentioned in my Financial Times rebuttal, that it's the management and the knowing associated with information technology which is important 
as much as the technology is, well, much more than the technology itself. It doesn't mean to say that we all have to be technicians, that we all have to be computer scientists, no. But we had better understand what is going on and what the technology can deliver and can't deliver and what the implications are. I, I tend to talk these days about information systems strategizing, not information systems strategy. And I'd like perhaps if we've got time to talk about the opening of strategy um, that is uh, uh, finding voice in the strategic management literature these days, primarily from Europe, I have to say, rather than from the US or other parts of the world. My mantra here is actions speak louder than words what counts is what we do not much what we say we plan to do in other words um, let's think about it in the uh, current context if we think back to december nine, uh, 2019 all that time back we would be setting key performance indicators in the past, we've talked about critical success factors. They're kind of meaningful. They're helping us to set goals. How meaningful are they now in the current COVID situation? So what, we th what I think we need to think about a bit more is actually understanding the operations that are taking place, the everyday practices and think in terms of adaptability, innovation, reflection, learning as being much more important. I think back to my time when I was doing some consultancy work for Shell, and I really am going to ancient, back to ancient history now. I'm talking about the 1980s, which probably tells you how old I am. Um, but Shell made a name for itself in terms of its scenario planning. So what would we do if this happened? Now, we can talk about an outbreak of COVID as if it were came as a complete surprise to us. In fact, there's someone in the, in the White House that talks in this way. We didn't expect this to happen. Well, let me tell you, we did. I know in my own country, there were government task forces talking about the next outbreak. You can, um, you can learn from the previous pre uh, uh, president of the United States who talked about um, outbreaks such as this. Didn't understand it was going to be COVID-19, but knew that something of this kind was going to happen. Why were we not thinking and I mean all of us here, I'm not blaming the politicians, why weren't we all thinking about unexpected out, um, uh, um, issues that we were going to have to confront in our business, whatever it is, whatever business we're in? Um, why didn't we do some scenario planning, some what-ifs? We talk about strategy. It tends to be something that's kind of handed down in tablets of stone from the chief executive lounge mountain for us to implement but it's not like that is it if we go back to my earlier comment actions speak louder and work than words what our strategy is in whatever organization we're talking about is what we actually do that's our strategy so understanding what is going on, understanding what is happening with the, with the technology is an absolute requirement of every single manager, whether they're happening to be at a supervisory level, at a middle management level, in the, in the CEO, in, in the chief executive suite, and uh, business uh, 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 ch uh, chair, chairs of uh, business. Um, not just for the CEO, should be aware of these things and should be asking these kinds of questions. I don't know if that's enough to, to get us started, but I could... Well, it, it's, it certainly is, but it, it, you know, strategy is a term that comes from the military and, and it's always been very much, uh, you know, 
uh, top-down in that regard, as opposed yep. to bottom-up, so to speak. And yes, yes, the military know that every battle plan will never go according to plan. <laughs> so, so Something you have resilience, so, it, so you may have the biggest strategy in the world. You know, <laughs> when, the, when, the, when you're in the actual field, things don't go according to plan. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, find, I mean, the, 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 obvious, the, the obvious example of that, isn't it? Sort of, we could think about the First World War. Keep sending men over the trenches. Oh, they're dying. Oh, we'll send some more over the trenches. Hmm, that doesn't seem to be work. Oh, we need to send more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, there's a requirement in certain organisations for there to be sort of a car command and control orientation. But in many businesses these days, and you know fully well in uh, Portal Business School, you can't have a command and control uh, approach to the management of the business. <laughs> um, let, let's not go there, perhaps. But anyway. Well, let's, yeah, let's, let's go back to the title of our session, in fact, which is uh, Squaring the Circle. Uh, I mean, IT, internationalization, sustainability. Well, what exactly do we mean by that? Um, are you implying there's a trade-off between globalization and sustainability, which to some extent we already had these days. I mean, if you look before COVID, some of these tensions were already there. But uh, can we operate internationally in a more sustainable way? And, and since we're talking about IT, what is the role of IT? Does it help or it doesn't help? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it can help, can't, can't it? I mean, uh, we're, we're going to talk, uh, you mentioned coming on to talk perhaps about my role in the FMD, in, 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 in quality services. Uh, just to give you an example, um, we, the, the directors of quality services, had a, a monthly meeting in Brussels, which we followed religiously, and we used the time very well. But since COVID, we have not had those monthly meetings. We've had Zoom meetings like we're having now. Um, are they as interactive? Uh, are they as flexible as just walking down the corridor and me saying, hey, Ramon, I've just thought of something. What, what are you doing about X or Y or Z? No, we have to kind of plan ahead a bit more and it's a bit more structured and we have to raise our hand when we want to speak because there might be five or six or a dozen of us. But we've begin, begun to learn about how to interact utilizing this technology now you mentioned before things like oh i mean a, a, an issue that we, we we're always trying to confront with uh, quality services whether it's with programmatic accreditation or institutional accreditation we say that business schools ought to be international now we ought to think about what we mean by that. What do we mean by being international? Does it mean always that one is going to be having our students have um, international experiences by going to um, a partner institution for a semester or a term or a year or something that of course is an excellent way of learning about a new context you mentioned my own background i've had a really blessed life in being in working in the uk in france in belgium in australia in the united states just to name a few these are fantastic experiences, and I wouldn't change that history of mine at all. I remember, actually, when I first went to Australia, I was doing what writing an article with a colleague on the west coast of the United States. And I would write something and then put it in an airmail envelope and send it <laughs> to Los Angeles. <laughs> And it would arrive a week or so later. And then I would get it back a week or so after that. So I'd wait two weeks, find some other comments and think again. And then, well, yes, we had telephone, but it was ex exceptionally expensive to be phoning 
from the west coast of Australia. We had to, we had to shout a lot because the other person <laughs> couldn't hear it, right? So. And, and on occasion, we had to get an operator to, <laughs> to fix the call for it. Again, I'm showing my age here. But, you know, um, I remember, too, asking for an article. I couldn't find it in, in Australia anywhere. And um, asking the British Library and fax machines at first I got to come in. And there was this thing appearing in front of my eyes from this fax machine. Yeah, I mean, yes, okay, that shows you in my lifetime how the technology has changed. We wouldn't be doing a Zoom call a couple of years ago. We had Skype and so on. But, um, you, you know, this is new technology. And look how the share price has gone for Zoom. Very well indeed, thank you. But... But let me say again about technology. How how do we cope? I'm not certain I'm asking the question, so, so pull me up on this. But how do we cope with old technology? You think about Harold Wilson in the United Kingdom as Prime Minister talked about the white heat of technology. And he introduced the concept of the open university. And in a relationship with the BBC, uh, people who were out of a job hadn't had um, uh, much of a, a schooling of any kind, not, hadn't gone to university, had the opportunity look, to look at programs, get things through the mail um, to work on. Uh, they were using technology back then in Australia, uh, uh, isolated communities where they would use radio to teach kids um, uh, in very isolated communities. All over the world, we have technologies, and they may not be 5G, and they may not be the, bro have not, uh, the, the broadband that we need uh, to utilise technology of this kind, but we have technologies which can be utilised, and this is all to the good. Where I, when I pull um, Nicholas Carr up in terms of saying IT doesn't matter, it, it absolutely does matter, as you in, 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 in indicated. But it's the management, it's the understanding of the, of the pluses and minuses of what is needed, our capabilities in organisations to utilise it. To remember some years ago, um, we had the outsourcing uh, uh, phenomenon. IT doesn't matter. You said there are unintended consequences, perhaps, of that article, article which, by the way, won the Best Paper of the Year award as, a, as a selected the by the remember, editor of the Harvard Business Review. I wonder if they'd like to have their time again and think, rethink this one. Um, but... Um, Yes, the, te the technology matters in the sense of understanding what are, are the cap uh, what, what are the possibilities. Mm -hmm. But then we better manage in our own organisations our capability to actually harness those opportunities and to understand the downsides, to understand, for example, security issues and privacy issues and so on. Um, now, Zoom has got some bad press in terms of privacy and secu security. And guess what? They learned and gave us the ability to stop um, individuals who we don't want coming into our meetings virtually and doing all kinds of mischief um, by uh, ensuring that we could make set uh, put the settings right so that we could that those people couldn't. Um, so it raid, as it were. But that means we have to have tech technologists who understand that we can do that with the settings. Well, exactly. That's, that, that's a very interesting point. So uh, before we get back to the, the main topic we're discussing, which is internationalization, sustainability, uh, just picking up on what you said, it seems that it's crucial for management in organizations to be open to IT uh, for the potential that they have in terms of enabling new possibilities. So this is not a technology question, but it's more about what can I do with it? And what can I do now, either with you know, enabling new possibilities or at least doing the old things in a more efficient, more effective way? Mm -hmm. uh, 
So what is then the sort of advice that you give to, to management who are not the technology specialists per se on how they should, A, um, manage that, let's say, uh, their own uh, knowledge, i.e. understanding of what technologies are, and B, how should they then relate slash treat uh, the technologists in their own organizations, the, the IT people, so to speak? Yeah, it, it is a difficult question. and it's not, There's not a simple solution here. Um, a colleague of mine back in the day, Michael Earle from Oxford University, but also from London Business School, used to talk a bit about hybrid managers. And the idea there was to give manage, uh, managers, executives, um, some insight into what was going on in the technical world and the technological side of things, but also the technologists having some exposure, much more exposure to the business. And that was his approach. Um, and I believe he did some work, for example, with British Petroleum uh, back in the day, BP, um, uh, in relation uh, to this uh, developing this kind of um, uh, management development uh, program with, within the organizer, organization. Let me give you some other ideas, though, here. And this is utilizing technology in a way within organizations in terms of strategizing. So I can come back to that idea of a more dynamic notion of not strategy, but strategizing. Um, some year, just a few years ago, I and some colleagues from Warwick and from Loughborough University, where I am. Um, an honorary visiting uh, professor uh, working with colleagues there and I've been working with people in information systems but also in the strategy area there and we did some work um, looking uh, actually at four companies in the telecoms industry how they were using social media of different kinds within the organization so going back to my earlier comment so strategy is set by the chief executive and the other chief uh, officers of the organization, right? And it's passed down and it's implemented, if only. Um, but if you add in ideas of, well, that kind of sets the scene and maybe we'll do some scenario planning as I was suggesting that Shell has, has done in the past. But then let's see what regional offices and the people on the shop floor are, are thinking about that. So you could build in utilizing social media, of whatever form, um, ideas of opening up. That's what I meant by opening strategy. So opening up the debates about, well, that is working in this Organize, this part of the organization, it's not so good in this part of the organization for these reasons. Now, that means there's a change of attitude of management because they have to be open to criticism from people who are lower down potentially in the hierarchy, and they have to respond to that. Um, and, you know, in some cultures that may be more difficult than in others. But it was interesting in one of the uh, organizations we looked at, and as I say, it was in the telecoms industry, was very open. The chief executive said, I am open to hearing what is going on. I need to know what's going on on the shop floor. And I need my senior executives to be on this journey with me and to be open to criticism and to hear what's being said and to react to those changes that are, are, are needed. And you could see the technology being used. But imagine if you had a, you've got social media, that's available to everyone. But if your management style is entirely hierarchical, the C-suite knows what the right answer and how dare you question us, well, you might as well not use that. That's just like a broadcasting model. You know, you could send it out on, in, you know, using Pravda to uh, to get the information out that's that's what i wanted to 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 mention it to, to a large extent this democratization requires a certain degree of humility also from from the management side uh, to be open as you as you indicated right listen and going back to your question um uh, you said 
you don't want to think in terms of solutions, but rather what what are the questions? What are the needs, right? So, and that brings me back to a question that I think many organizations uh, probably are dealing with to bring these two communities together, the one who has the questions and therefore the needs on the user side, on the business side, and the ones who may have the answers on the technology side, where the technical they brought together in the so-called steering, IT steering committees in organizations. And uh, do you see any, let's say, movement, change, uh, advice, as we move forward on how these IT steering committees should operate, should work effectively? Given the things that you're from my experience, and, and and this is very much a generalization, and I'm open to alternative views here very much. But my experience has been that those IT steering committees tend to be IT steering committees, in the sense that um, we may be talking about an investment in this technology or that technology, or there's an issue with um, uh, some application or platform or whatever. And of course, those things are exceptionally important. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm talking about something I think a little bit broader than that. And that is understanding on the you know, whether you're in marketing or in finance or whatever, to understand what is really required um, in terms of, one, the attitudes. You, you mentioned the, uh, in response to my comment about the attitudes of management being open, but also an attitude which is, let's not leave that to the techie. You know, I'm not a techie. It was almost like a badge of honour, wasn't it? It has been in, in the past by some executives that I don't know IT you deal with it. I, I mentioned outsourcing, for example, offshoring. This was a kind of let someone else deal with it. But guess what? The best outsourcing relationships were a partnership so that you were managing the relationship, not just leaving it to the, uh, to the provider. And, and to, all too often, many of um, those outsourcing, you know, you used to hear, oh, get the legality right, let's get the contract right, you know. And then we can leave it to them. But then and guess what? They would come back and say, oh, we've got to do X, Y, and Z. That's not in the contract. We need more uh, recompense for the, the additional work we need. And that's not the way. It's almost like setting up a prenuptial agreement yeah. between <laughs> yes. um, a woman and a, a, and a man. You know, well, we know we're going to get divorced later, but come on, let's, let's sort it out. Maybe, maybe you not. Know, that's, not, that's not a partnership. <laughs> You know, let's, let's go into the partnership in a, well, in a some, more open way. Uh, so, some people would say that such attitude is really an abdication of responsibilities. Uh, exactly. my hands, I just give it up and, and then uh, yeah, don't exactly. bother me. Whereas, in fact, even then you need to manage the relationship with the outsource, you know, with the outsourcing company. Because exactly. You better be so, on top so, of things. So. So, so in that sense, you know, information technology and its management is not a utility. Yes. Going back to Nicol Nicholas Carr's art article, it's not. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, you mentioned MBAs and, and so on. MBAs need to have this kind of material put in front of them. You know, the, the world of marketing is much different with information technology than um, it was five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. The world of finance has changed completely as a result. Well, that's, that's of a, now, now that you mentioned that, this is a, an interesting question. We are in business schools, you mentioned MBAs. So what should MBAs know about IT and IT management these days? I mean, you know, it's one of these, we've been in this field for many years. We've seen it in many colors coming and going. Part of it is driven by technological change, obviously, and the application areas. It was used to be on operations, then, uh, you know, well, initially finance and accounting, then operations, then marketing. Uh, now it's digital transformation, business models, etc. So what should a curriculum on IT slash IT management should look like these days for an MBA? Just well, I mean, I mean, we, we have little time, but you know, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it is those those management issues. It is the, the understanding what the technology has done to the various operations that are taking place in one's own organization. And you mentioned society before, and I think you know there are ethical concerns that we ought to be uh, aware of as well in terms of how one 
utilizes these technologies. There are you know, aspects to these technologies which are less um, pleasant than might otherwise be the case. Um, being aware of uh, uh, issues of sustainability, and you mentioned the journal Strategic Information Systems that uh, I edited and, and uh, you partnered with me for a number of years back in the day. Uh, we had a special issue on green IT. You, you know, it, it sounds, isn't it, wonderful that we are utilising uh, uh, less paperwork, for example. We are not having to travel so much, etc. Well, you know, how much uh, is it costing us to run te technology in the past where we used to have rooms full of massive mainframes with all kinds of requirements for air conditioning and so on to ensure that they didn't blow up in flames and so on. I mean, uh, what about what what about our security um, um, uh, um, issues? How, how are we dealing with um, what would happen if we had a fire in our IT centre? Do we have a backup somewhere? What what are we doing in terms of managing our material on the cloud? You know, these kinds of these are general things. They don't have to go into the technology in great detail, but you better be aware of some of the issues that are going on. Let me give you another example. Okay, what well, not that long ago we were talking about business process re-engineering. Don't automate, obliterate, said someone. Um, in, in the literature, again, I think it might have been Harvard Business Review, um, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the person's name was Hammer, which is probably a good name for this person, as he was obliterated. But anyway, um, so, some colleagues who were involved in that movement also said within a year, we're writing articles talking about BPR as the fad that forgot people because people say oh we can get rid of middle management we we don't need these old processes we don't need the company knowledge that uh, uh, resided in the heads of mi middle managers and suddenly we were finding ourselves in difficulty so here's another thing that we might want to bring back into the curriculum and that is an old uh, topic of socio-technical systems there's a pretty um i mean you think back to leave it what was it in the 1960s mm -hmm. seven 60 years ago how relevant is that to everyday management these days hmm. have a look at leave it's diamond uh, students out there listening to this you know, and I think it talks about technology and structure and processes and organization and so on. And you can apply that kind of thinking uh, to the issues of today. I would say let's not be blinded by the new fads and fashions. We've gone through um, IT for competitive advantage, business process re-engineering, knowledge management. Now it's digital innovation. What's it going to be next week? <laughs> these are these some of some of the issues that we're dealing with are actually with us and have been with us for many years. The technology has changed, but the issues haven't changed that much. Not that much. If if I may, given that you know we are moving and time wise we 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 don't have as much left. I would like to change gears for a second, and and uh, given that you are the FMD uh, and you are in the position of knowing what's happening at many schools, and and, and uh, now I'm let's leave technology for a second, and uh, mm. and let's focus on on the, the current situation that's affecting our lives, which is COVID, and the lives of business schools that are trying to uh, manage the situation, and now going back to normal, whatever normal means, uh, operation, right, to restart uh, face to face presential operation. So what are you hearing these days about schools? What decisions have been taken? Are there any lessons that uh, you can share with us or that we should be aware of? Well, I think there is a there is the issue of the closing down campus, campuses and this really impacted colleagues, for example, in New Zealand and Australia because 
uh, as well as in China and other parts of uh, Asia. So let me let's say Aus uh, Australasia more more generally as as a region. And of course, things were were occurring there earlier than they happen in, in in Europe. And if you think about it from a business school perspective or university perspective, their academic year is the calendar year. They're not starting in the, in our northern autumn. They're starting in February. Um, bang, beginning of an academic year, and then suddenly you're faced with this issue. So they had to really struggle. Uh, and you think of the number of students coming from Asia to Australia and New Zealand for, to, for study, and it's hit them really financially. Uh, so they, they, they've really had to struggle. I mean, as nations, they've, they've controlled the outbreak exceptionally well, um, but they've had, in a sense, they've had the ability to do so in a way that perhaps is, a, is less easy for us in a European setting where we have very flexible borders between one or have had very flexible borders from one country to another. Um, and not perhaps so, so flexible as now. I was talking to a colleague um, uh, who you may know quite well, Ramon, uh, it, trying to get from, um, from, from the Netherlands to, 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 Bel uh, to, Brussels, uh, to Belgium was quite difficult. Uh, it is, uh, it is, I know. <laughs> it still is, I believe. Um, but no, so, so, so there were those things, and the closing down and honestly, the total reliance on distance, distance education all of a sudden. Uh, if I can use more experiences in, in, in Europe as an example, I, I think we've gone from the close down and, the, and in this country it's been, you know, for certain students, let's um, forget about examinations for a year, let's let people go through to the next year of their study, if it's an undergraduate program, for example, especially for first year students, um, to then thinking in terms of, well, what are we going to do for this next academic year? And from almost at the height of the, of the pandemic, from, well, we've got to go virtual, to an understanding now that there is so much Again, there's a socio-technical element to this. Uh, well, there's so much gained from a university experience, whether it happens to be at the undergraduate level, where it's socialising, it's, uh, you know, your first experience of being away from home and whatever, to an executive audience who gains so much from each other. For example, on an MBA programme, which is an executive type in MBA programme. You know, I, I remember once teaching an executive program and I learned so much from it. I lost my voice. So I almost felt like a conductor in this class asking one executive to another to express their, almost soundless because I could hardly speak. And, in, and that's an understanding that, that there's so much learning within the class itself uh, we are facilitators more. So that's understanding how we can utilize the technology to facilitate learning. And it may be at a distance, but some of it can be in pods away from the university as well as within the university. Some of it may be on campus, but again, that will depend on circumstances within that particular country, whether that's even possible or not. So it's being, you know, what is the art of the feasible? I'm, I'm reminded um, of, of a professor of mine when I was doing my undergraduate, uh, my master's studies at Lancaster University, Peter Checkland, um, and his soft systems methodology. And again, there was kind of scenario planning in in relation to, wasn't called that, but there was kind of that alternative viewpoints in being incorporated into the into the um, into the methodologies, um, and he would talk about not only desirable strategies but feasible strategies. So, what what, what do we have the capability to do yes. technologically, um, in terms of the regulations that are uh, 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 are are impo imposed on us by governments 
or regional governments in certain countries as well as uh, federal governments. Uh, wh what is the art of the possible here? What can we do in these circumstances? It may not be um, the solution, going back to that comment, yeah. but it may be a feasible, I and mean, we may be kind of satisfying. It reminds me of... It's the, as good as we can do in these circumstances. It reminds me a little bit of the resource-based view of strategy, right? That you, you, yeah. you look at your capabilities rather than wishful ideas. Wishful thinking. Right? But it's, yeah. it's always one of the other is you don't have the capabilities that stretching all could lead you to acquire capabilities that you don't have. So there's always a, a give and take to some extent. Yeah. That's that's another discussion on strategy which we don't have time <laughs> for. So, anyway, I, but, but, but you, your question you were about, asking about... Yeah. So, sorry, sorry the, 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 the different... You know, and, and of course there are very many different business schools. Uh, you know, take a, um, an IMD, yes. for example which is very much about executive education. Correct, yeah. Some work going on at the doctoral level with other institutions in, in, the, in the region, with some MBA, but very much executive education. Um, in the UK, at London Business School is a very different entity to the Judge Business School in Cambridge um, or Warwick Business School uh, in the social studies faculty of the University of Warwick. I was provost of Bentley University in Boston. Uh, this is a, a private business university. I always used to say, imagine a, bus a, a, a university within a business school, not the other way around, <laughs> because that's what we were. We had arts and sciences faculty. So we're dealing with very different in, um, organizations, which we use the, the common terminology of business school, but we can't say there's one approach which is appropriate for one uh, uh, and appropriate for all. We therefore have to listen to those different circumstances and understand what the different issues are that they each, each are, are dealing with. Well, what, it seems to me that this, this rush to uh, online, which has been imposed by the circumstances, of course, uh, <laughs> most schools had to overnight almost uh, switch to online. But uh, clearly, uh, one thing is to do that for a limited period of time, but everybody understands, but when the thing was here to stay, as it has been much longer than any of us were expecting at the time, then, uh, you know, our audience executives, uh, you know, were confronted with an experience. This is not what they wanted to, or not, not that they paid for. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, uh, there are two implications uh, there. One is if you do it and you insist in doing that, you may be losing your, your, your clients. But secondly, and that's more general statement uh, in the rush to do that many people were not prepared including faculty and others so many people in fact may have had a bad experience and may have given online a bad name uh, whereas we know that some schools that are doing it properly uh, these programs are even being accredited by efmd they're in the ranking of financial times so there is something to be said for online right so do you think that this has been hurting or is going to be hurting uh, the real proper well, I, 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 it might but what I would say is, I, I would hope, and again, this is part of the IS strategizing thing that I've been talking about, but what has worked and what hasn't? What have we learned from this? So we know that we better not do a three hour le lecture. <laughs> yeah. <Online. laughs> I mean, let me, uh, it's time to maybe at this point to open some, some questions from, oh, okay. from the audience. Yeah, I, you know, I may have one or more, but let's see what comes up here. This we have one um, uh, from Rui Coutinho. Uh, organizations rush into the tech dimension of digital transformation. They can build platforms, use the tools and the software available. But what about the layer of digital culture, the way humans perform and behave under the new tech context? What are the changes, the knowledges, the skills needed for that adjustment? Yeah. Great question. Yeah, well, then let me let me combine what we started to talk about before sure. we talked about this question. So, what, so you said before, what might have da damaged distance learning? Well, it could be that someone wasn't prepared and simply 
translated what they were going to do face to face and put it online. It was the only thing they could do, probably. This is maybe the only thing they could do, but that doesn't mean to say that learning at a distance is always a bad thing. So what I would do is, is you even think about it in terms of, okay, well, what could we do to utilise the technology in a way which is innovative and your learning? And I think in terms of, well, there are some things that we are doing anyway, even if we are, we're running a face-to-face -face program, we might be asking our executives, for example, to prepare something in, in, prior to coming to a seminar or, or a workshop on, or, on campus. It might be, what's going on in your company about X, Y, or Z? And then they would come prepared for a discussion. Now, how, how about utilising that as an approach to online learning? Even at the executive level, where, as I was saying before, one's learning so much from one's colleagues on the programme as much from the professor who is there, in a sense, who is the conductor of the orchestra, who's bringing people together and, and facilitating the conversation. Um, Cambridge University have just said, like many others uh, in the UK, that for next uh, for next academic year they will be having students on campus, but they will be doing their lectures online while the students are on campus because we're afraid in this country that there might be a second wave as far as the the virus is concerned. And of course, we we don't want that, and if we had you know, a hundred people turning up to a lecture, sitting next to each other there, and someone has it, then um, that's going to spread like wildfire and we're back to square one. So again, thinking in terms of what might we do differently? What do we learn hasn't worked, but we could try something different. Let me give you another example. A colleague of mine in, at Bentley University in strategy. We had great technology there. We have great te technology there, which is far ahead of its time. Um, and so a kind of a language lab set up. It was much more than that. But he was running a strategy class. And the students in the strategy class, it was an undergraduate class as it happens, were given a curriculum, which was the same as a partner institution in Latin America. I think it was in... Argentina, I might be wrong, but one of the Spanish-speaking countries in, in uh, South America. I think it was Argentina. Um, and so the students were doing a strategy class and they would be in working in virtual teams on the same case study. And the students in the US were having to speak Spanish. And the students in... Spanish-speaking part of South America was speaking English. So was it an English class, uh, a, a, a foreign language class? Yes. Was it a working in virtual teams class? Yes. Was it a strategy class? Yes. But it was all in the one class. Now that, to me, was a But also, of course, the students would talk to each other. Oh, that's going on in your country. Oh, no, no, I don't. So there was a. It was an, in a sense we were t we were turning internationalization into cross cultural learning. I, I was, but also virtual learning, <laughs> working in virtual. I mean, all of those things are, are very positive. Were there some limitations? Were there some technical glitches? Of course there were, but that was a reality that the students would be facing within organisations particularly if they were working for uh, a multinational, for example, well, they would have to do this anyway. I was, I was going to say, I mean, uh, you are at EFMD, and we know that one of the key criteria for accreditation at EFMD is internationalization. So what is the new meaning of internationalization? How do we think about internationaliz internationalization in an era in which we have technology that allows us to do the kinds of things that we have seen are now possible in fact, they were possible before, but we are now using them. That's the difference. Yeah. And we realize that uh, you know the sum of that may be here to stay, and we can all become much more international without having to travel, which is a more sustainable yeah. way 
which is how we are squirting the circle, going back to your... <laughs> There you go. And, and, and I suppose it's thinking about these things that we've been forced into this, but now, you know, we, 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 if we're reflecting on this, we should be thinking about what are the possibilities. Now, I, I know some, uh, some schools, which are we name, name us, and their clientele, their students, have tended to come from less fortunate backgrounds. Mm -hmm. They have opportunities, the students are given opportunities to go for a semester uh, abroad. But hang on, they're, they're working with the family business. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're helping to make ends meet at home. They don't, they don't have the wherewithal to go on these international excursions. Why aren't we giving them the possibilities of learning like our students were doing in Bentley and in Latin America in terms of interacting. I bet you there were some relationships which were formed in those virtual teams and those students, when they have the ability, might be going to visit Buenos Aires or wherever it was um, from, from the States or from Latin America uh, up to Boston. You know, um, these are possibilities that can emerge, the good side of the technologies that we have available to us now. And now, just one question, which has nothing to do with IT, but it has to do with your country. Oh, no. <laughs> I know what's coming. I'm sorry, exactly. I can't resist it. I mean, this COVID thing, and remember where we were before Christmas, right? I mean, it, everybody for the last three years have been talking just about one thing. Now, we don't hear anything about Brexit on, on, on this side of the Atlantic, at least. I, I'm sure the discussion must be going on at some stage, but uh, I guess I cannot... Stop but thinking COVID has delayed all our operations in, uh, in the rest of the world, um, as, I'm, as I am sure it has for the Brexit process, even though your prime minister insists on keeping the, the, the deadline and so yes. forth. So well, what do you see as the impact of COVID on, on Brexit and maybe the other way around, the, the, the whole Brexit thing uh, with Remainers and Leavers, they probably have different views on how this um, crisis is being managed and, and the way forward. Well, we, we we probably ought to start talking about the United Kingdom Kingdom as the disunited kingdom. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we're split down the middle. Uh, we we talk about um, you know there was a there was a majority in favour of Brexit, and there was, but it was you know whatever it was fifty one point or fifty two point eight or something against you know. 48%. So pretty even, really. Um, yes, there were millions uh, more on one side than the other, but then, you know, we, we didn't have the, the future generations voting, the 16-year-olds who are now uh, old enough to vote. So, you know, it's, and they tended to be more pro staying in, in the European Union. So we are, there are very different, distinctive views, and they're still firmly held. I have to say, for the most part, it's essentially 50-50 in the country. And then you have nations like Scotland, devolved uh, administrations, Scotland, Northern Ireland, who voted to remain. England and Wales voted to leave. So there's that issue that we, we have to cope with. A couple of things I would say. It's not only uh, on continent, in continental Europe where Brexit tends to be off the agenda. You hardly hear anything about it. Occasionally you might hear, oh, there was a meeting between and um, we're not being treated as equal as the European bloc. Well, we're... But Michel Barnier would say, well, you're a single nation, and we're a 27 other countries, so <laughs> of course we're not equal. Uh, but there are things like fisheries and so on that we hear about are, are sticking point. But we are hearing um, that the government, for good or ill, wants to keep, to keep to its agenda. I would hope there's one thing which comes out of this, which is positive, and that is a realisation that poorly paid... Uh, people in the social and care sectors, as well as the uh, health services, the carers who are terribly poorly paid, who many of whom do who come from other European countries, uh, that we really do understand how th these are very skillful people who should be paid more. 
and who should have the opportunity to come to the UK if they wish to come to the UK. And that should be made e uh, more easy. And there's certainly a, a movement across the political, political divide which is uh, calling for that. I, I hope that comes true. Just for our Portuguese audience, I do not know if you remember, but your prime minister, when he was under you know, in intensive care, he had two nurses that had taken care of him. One of them happened to be from Porto. So, yes, indeed. So, so much indeed. more. I, I hope his memory is not short. So, exactly. Well, I mean, we have reached the end of our of our time. Uh, I just uh, let me say uh, a, a few words just to to conclude what I think has been a very interesting uh, discussion, and I'm sure you agree with me that we could have uh, spent more time on any of these things. Uh, we, we, we talk about the importance of IT. We certainly concluded that IT matters. We, we knew that and it matters a lot. But more significantly, we discussed the importance of good IT management and, and what uh, business executives should are or should be doing about IT management, how they should uh, strategize, interact, and create the conditions for organizational transformation and, and competitive advantage, which can be enabled through, through IT. I, I remember a quote from Michael Porter when all this discussion was going on. Is the internet rendering this whole thing irrelevant and whatever? He said, while some have argued that uh, the internet renders strategy obsolete, the opposite is in fact true. It is more important than ever for companies to distinguish themselves through strategy. Okay, so again, I think back to your point, these are tools that give us possibilities. We need to understand them. We need to understand what the possibilities are and create strategy through these uh, possibilities. So thank you, Rob. I uh, thank you, Bob, I suppose that's your proper <laughs> name uh, for, for this interesting conversation and for the exchange of views. And, and I hope to see you again uh, as, you know, in other activities that we may uh, be organizing at our school. Um, and thank you for all the viewers uh, who have joined us uh, tonight. Uh, remember that every week uh, at Porto Business School, we host two seminars, one uh, uh, webinars, I should say, uh, one on Tuesdays, uh, which is called Beyond Now, and this one, the Dean's Lounge, on Thursdays. Uh, goodbye, and uh, see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.